Okay, uh, today we're going to talk on chapter 20, mountain ranges, or the continental uh, convergent boundaries, not continental, convergent boundaries. So when we talked about the ocean floors, we talked about basically the divergent margins of plate tectonics. We're going to be talking here basically the convergent boundaries in plate tectonics now. So we're going to talk about mountain building. Now, mountain building has gone on for much of the geologic past. Uh, we can look at an image of the world or an illustration of the world and see the mountain ranges. I'm going to use a, one that's a little bit different than the one that's in your book. The one that's in your book is a shaded relief with some names on it. This is a, kind of similar, but it's color-coded. And the color coding is to, to show younger mountains in red, older mountains in that blue, I think it is, maybe a green, I'm not sure. Uh, the shields are in yellow. Um, so if we look at the newer mountain ranges on the world today, there's basically two major lines of mountains in the world today. And that is going to be the, uh, the Cordelian through the... Andes mountain range, which basically runs all the way along the west coast of the Americas, and then the um, Alp, Alpine to Himalaya complex, which runs all the way basically through Eurasia. Both of these are the youngest ranges, the younger ranges. Now looking at some of the older ones, we have the Appalachians in the eastern North America, which correspond with the Cordelian, uh, or not the Cordelian, the Caledonian belt, in, which goes from England up into Scandinavia. You have the Urals, um, which are in the middle of Russia, uh, basically in an area that used to be considered the boundary, part of the boundary line between Europe and Asia as a continent. Um, and then you have the Great Divided Range or Dividing Range in Australia. These are some of the mountain ranges that we see. Now, what is mountain building? In geology, we call this orogenesis, the process of producing a mountain belt. It basically has three primary factors to it. You have compressional forces, which are going to do folding and faulting. You're going to have uh, metamorphism and you will have igneous activity. All three of these are combined in the process. Now, with the idea of plate tectonics, it appears that mountain building primarily occurs along the convergent plate boundaries. So if we look, think back to the plate tectonics from chapter 19 about those boundaries, uh, what are the major features of a subduction zone? Well, we have the deep ocean trench, which is the region where the oceanic lithosphere is subducting into the Earth itself, going through down through the athenosphere into the mesosphere. Um, it's basically the depth of the trench, the angle of the trench is going to be related to the age and temperature of the subducting slab. Uh, we have examples of this, like the Marianas Trench, the Pacific in the Western Pacific, the Pelucili Trench, and the Eastern Pacific off the coast of South America, uh, the Tonga Trench um, near Australia, uh, and then there's the one I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but they're in the Caribbean island uh, around the Caribbean also. Now, typically speaking, when we have an oceanic based subduction zone, we are also going to have a volcanic arc. Remember, if it's uh, volcanic islands, we call it a volcanic island arc. If the arc is in a continent, we call it a continental volcanic arc. This is built on the overlying plate. Again, the idea being that the subducting plate is carrying water with it in either water in cracks or crevices or water bearing minerals. That water is getting released as the plate heats up and begins to melt and that helps to lower the melting temperature of the materials around it which then allows for the production of magma. Um, the four arc region is usually the area between the trench and the volcanic arc. The back arc is usually the opposite side of the volcanic arc on the uh, opposite of the trench. Sometimes we can get some very interesting sedimentary units that come out of this, uh, very common sandstone that will form 
in these trenches near volcanic arcs is what we call a gray wacky. It's a sandstone that's made up of mostly lithospheric fra uh, uh, lith litho boy, I'm having trouble today with words. Um, lithic fragments. So fragments of rock instead of grains of individual minerals like an arco sandstone being no almost nothing but quartz. So what are the d dynamics in the subduction zone? Um, it can get to be really complex, and I don't want to spend too much time on it because of its complexity, but uh, you can get extension and back arc spreading behind the subduction zone, behind the volcanic uh, arc. If we look at Japan, uh, let's see, do I happen to have... I don't see a good map of that right now, but if we look at Japan, um, the trench is actually to the east of Japan. You have the Sea of Japan, which is the, uh, the ocean area between Japan and China. That is actually spreading a little bit, and it has to do with the complex nature of the way the forces are transmitted and the way things are moving within the crust uh, is you're compressing one area, you're lifting something else up and stretching it a little bit. So you get this back arc basin that is uh, spreading. Um, this can actually produce a basin which will develop a very thick layer of sediment over time, which helps us understand some of the, the systems that have developed in the past. Now, we do get also compression regimes in the subduction zone which occur as the overlying plate advances towards the trench, faster than the trench is retreating due to subduction. Uh, the resulting compression is going to shorten and thicken the crust, basically starting our process of building mountains. So, moving into the idea of building mountains, if we look at an island arc mountain building, we have two ocean plates that are converging, and one is subducted underneath, usually the older of the two. The volcanic island arc results from the steady subduction of the oceanic lithosphere, and you have this continued development that results in the formation of a mountainous topography consistent, consisting of both igneous and metamorphic rocks. If you look at the Caribbean islands, right now those are a fairly young volcanic island arc. Most of the islands in the Caribbean islands are less than a handful of volcanic uh, features, each island. Some of them are only one or two volcanoes. Compare that with the island of Japan, the islands of Japan. Each one of the Japanese islands is literally hundreds, if not thousands of volcanoes uh, that have been formed over time. And many of the older ones have been compressed, they've been faulted, they have uh, some degree of metamorphic features to them. So we're seeing this compression occurring within that area. And this is in part because it's an older system. So it's been around longer. It's been put through more. Compare this to uh, a mountain building like the Andes Mountains, where instead of an ocean-to-ocean -ocean subduction zone, we have an ocean-to-continental subduction zone. Um, this is basically, again, the oceanic plate is subducting under the continental plate. We again will have volcanic activity, although that volcanic activity is not going to be quite as prolific as a, an ocean-to-ocean -ocean subduction zone. In an ocean-to-ocean -ocean subduction zone, you don't have as much matter or mass sitting on top of, this, of the melting material to block it from moving through. So... Whereas you'll get more frequent volcanic eruptions in a volcanic island arc. When you're dealing with an Andean type system, you're going to see a lot of igneous activity, but you're going to get a fair amount of that that is going to be in place at depth. And it's going to create igneous bodies at depth. So granite bodies or um, diorite bodies. You also tend to, because of the overriding continental material, tend to see a more felsic system because as the magma is moving up, remember all the way back to our talks about magmatic evolution, the magma is going to in, melt some of that surrounding rock and incorporate that chemistry into it, 
which will move it towards a more felsic chemistry, making it uh, the magma more viscous, meaning it's harder to flow, probably increasing the volatile content, meaning it's probably going to be a much more explosive type of volcanism that occurs when it does occur. So the magma will buoyantly rise until it reaches a point of equal density, and then it will undergo through a differentiation process, you know, the cooling. Uh, if you remember back to Bowen's reaction series, the fact that certain minerals are going to crystallize out of the melt first. As they crystallize from the melt, they're going to change the chemistry of the melt, removing iron and magnesium from the melt, enriching the melt in silicon and potassium. So we get uh, volcanics that are going to be dominated with uh, pyroclasts and pyroclastic flows and uh, thicker lavas. So we get that emplacement of plutons, uh, which can be uplifted then. If the system has died down, this is sort of like the Sierra Nevada today in California. There used to be a subduction zone off the coast of California, but that subduction zone overrode the plate and changed into a transform boundary. Um, we also have as part of the subduction zones, at least in a continent ocean or an ocean to ocean subduction zone, again, we've talked about this before, the accretionary wedge, which is that chaotic accumulation of debris and sediment that is basically scraped off the subducting plate and plastered onto the overriding plate. Again, very much like if you were to take a razor to your skin, whether it's shaving your legs, shaving your back, shaving your arm, shaving your chest, shaving your face, your head, whatever, and you've got some sort of a pimple, uh, ingrown hair, a wart, a little mole, whatever, run it over wrong and you're going to slice whatever that bump is off and apply it to the razor and, and have it build up on the razor. So uh, the accretionary wedge, you can think of in that sort of an analogy that you're scraping material off and plastering it against the edge of the continent. Now, if this happens long enough, you could actually build up the accretionary wedge to the point where it itself will protrude above sea level and become part of the continental mass above the sea level. Um... The four arc basin can grow, uh, have the a growing accretionary wedge act as a barrier to se sediment moving from the arc to the trench. And you can create this basin area behind it to do this. Um, how about continent to continent collision? This is the Himalayan style of mountain building, where two lithospheric plates, both carrying continents, come together. Continent-to-continent -continent collisions develop compressional mountains that are characterized by uh, shortened and thickened crust. Most of these areas will exhibit extreme, intense folding and thrust faulting of mountains, uh, usually what we call fold and thrust belt. And then there's going to be within it a zone that we call the suture zone. Now, the Himalaya mountains are youthful. The collision in the Himalayas began about 45 million years ago. India collided with the Eurasian plate and is actually being pushed under Eurasia. Uh, the spreading center that propelled India northward is still active. It's still pushing India northwards. Um, similar but older continental collisions occurred when Europe collided with Asia to form the Euro Mountains, or even further back when Europe and Africa um, collided with North America to form the what are now today we call the Appalachians and the Caledonian uh, Ranges, but back then they would have been something this akin to the Himalayas today. <clears throat> Now, that orogeny that formed the Appalachians occurred between 300 million to 250 million years ago. Uh, the compression that we're seeing in these 
types of mountain ranges have several major events that go with them. After the breakup of the continental landmass, uh, a thick wedge of sediment is developed along the passive margin, going back to what we talked about under uh, the, ocean, the ocean sea floors. Due to changes in the direction of the plates, and that can actually happen. We've seen evidence of it. We haven't seen it happen ourselves yet, but it's going to. It's going to happen um, at some point in time. In fact, actually, what will probably happen in India is right now India is being shoved under Asia uh, into that subduction zone. Well, back here behind at the back end of India, at some point, that probably is going to break and then create a new subduction zone under India instead of maintaining the one that India is being forced into right now. But we also have some evidence that occurred along the, um, the coast of what is now North America in what used to be called Laurentia of a period of time somewhere between the Cambrian and the Devonian periods where the subduction zone switched directions. So instead of the subduction zone, uh, it, you had, you had a, what may have been an ocean-to-ocean -ocean subduction zone with an island arc and the Laurentian uh, continent, what eventually will become North America, comes in towards that. The continental material is too buoyant. It cannot subduct. So what happened is, is it reached the subduction zone and stopped, and the plates switched so that the plate that was being uh, the plate that was being subducted became the overriding plate, and the plate that was the overriding plate became the subducting plate. We see some changes in the geology in that area that indicates that this had to have been what happened, but we haven't actually seen this happen yet ourselves. So we know it can happen. We don't have anywhere right now that really fits the bill for having that flip happen yet, but we'll keep an eye out. I mean, what's a few billion years? Now, when that happened with uh, Laurentia, what was the, let's call it, for lack of a better term, the ancient Atlantic Ocean then began to close up. And we had the collision that formed the Appalachians and, and the Caledonians ultimately creating Pangaea. Um, this creates another feature that goes on with these systems, and that is terrains. Terrains are another mechanism of orogenesis. Um, they're kind of a unique thing. They're very similar to the accretionary wedge, and in many ways they're related to the accre accretionary wedge. But instead of just being simply material being scraped off the over uh, scraped off by the overriding plate from the subducting plate, these are more like larger bodies that are getting plastered up against the continent. Uh, these are small crustal fragments, so they could be volcanic islands or uh, smaller subcontinental blocks, kind of like India. Uh, India is technically in a, a created terrain. Um, but they could be microcontinents, islands, etc., just get smashed in one after another after another. And uh, they, they could be island arcs. I mean, it's, it could be any number of the features that we talk about. But they get accreted onto the edge of the continent. They get smeared onto the continent and help build the continent up in terms of its size. Um, as the plates are moved, any oceanic plateaus that are there, island arcs, microcontinents, they're just getting scraped off and plastered into the continent. That's also putting a lot of force on the continent and causing a lot of metamorphism and folding and faulting to occur as well. Now, let's see. Um... Yeah, if we look through the North Amer uh, the North American uh, Cordilleria uh, mountain building event, aka the Rockies or mountain building mountain belt, the Rockies, um, 
we see a lot of accreted trains on the west coast of North America today. And these are thought to have been islands and other bodies that were scattered throughout the Pacific that just were swept up. Now, we can also get mountain building from faulting only, uh, namely block mountains, fault block mountains. This usually occurs more instead of a collision area, continental rifting type of area, so where the ground is trying to pull apart. Remember, normal faults are formed by t by tension, the stretching of the crust. Um, you can create these block fault mountains with high angle faults that are usually flat, uh, <clears throat> flattened with depth. We call these listric faults because they, they are high angle and they curve downwards. Um, these can cause faults where instead of the mountains, let me draw it out. Block fault mountains really can come in two different types. There's the horse and graben type, which we've talked about, and then the listric type. Horse and graben. look something like this okay so if we look at the the relative motions on the fault lines we see that the blocks basically moved in the same directions on the same sides like that okay in a more listric system I'm going to draw this a little bit exaggerated We see it's more of a rotational motion that's taking place. Okay, so this is both of these are block fault mountain types. They're just different types. This is this is a little more of a um, what's the word I want to use? Um, equal tension being applied to either side of the system. So you have an equal pull apart in my estimation here. Whereas here this tends to be a little more one-sided in the way that the tension is being pulled through. So you get a you get this rotational aspect to the blocks. That's pretty much the way the basin and range province of North America was formed. And in fact if you look at the basin and range province, it's a fairly large province um, Let's see, which book is it in? Yes, the other book. This kind of shows it here. Um, you have the, the coastal range, the Great Valley, uh, the Sierra Nevada. And then basically everything west of, or east of that is the basin and range in North America, almost to the Rio Grande Valley, with the exception, of course, of the Colorado Plateau, which the basin and range actually wraps around. Uh, the basin and range wraps around the Colorado Plateau and continues northwards around it. Most of the orientation, however, still remains the same. Now, the basin and range is a little bit different in terms of it may or may not be related directly to a rifting. Um, it definitely leads into the Rio Grande Rift Valley, so you can make that as, that argument that it is part of the Rift Valley. But then again, the Rift Valley is also a failed Rift Valley, and it, the idea of how that Rift Valley happened might not be as simple as the continent tried to break apart. Um, one of the things that we knew is that the extension of the Basin and Range began about 20 million years ago. And the crust has expanded about 100%. So it's tw the distances are now twice the distance between points that they used to be. Uh, we know that we have high heat flow and several episodes of volcanism that have occurred. That volcanism might give us the key to what happened with the basin and range. During this time, 
North America was overriding part of uh, one of the one of the tectonic plates in the Pacific. Um, it was getting closer and closer to the mid Pacific rise, or the Pacific spreading ridge. As it did this, the subducting plate became a shallower and shallower angle. This had an interesting effect because one of the things that we see is an older wave of volcanism that moved from west to east over time, uh, over 40 million years ago. Then that volcanism stopped and started going back the other direction. And associated with it was also uh, some degree of spreading. What we think may have happened is the overlying plate of North America was going oh un, had the 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 subducting plate going under it at a very shallow angle. This is also part of the reason why when we look at the Cordillerian of North America, i.e. the Rockies why the mountain belt is so incredibly wide. It's much wider than would be expected for a simple ocean to continent collision zone. Um, many times wider than it really should be. And the only explanation that we really have for this is that the subducting plate was subducting at a very, very shallow angle because it was fairly young, which meant it was hot and buoyant, or relatively hot and buoyant. But then, once that subduction stopped, the plate, that bottom plate, peeled off and sank. Well, that peeling off may have triggered the extension event that tore the basin and range open. Um, and also may have done the younger age of volcanics that then swept back through, which seemed to have gone from the east to the west. So, it's a, it's, the basin and range is a little more complex of a story but it's no less fascinating in that it, the way we have to try to put the story together and use our deductive reasoning to understand the evidence that we see really goes back to the whole idea from the beginning. I said where geology is putting together a story. We're putting together the story of the earth. We have bits and pieces of the story intact, i.e., if we're talking about a mystery novel, maybe we have the last page, maybe we have a few paragraphs, a few sentences, occasionally some words, and then scraps of letters throughout the rest of the book. Our job is to put that story back together. So we have, we have that spreading that tore up the basin and range, but it also created um, th these periods of volcanism. If you go north to Tucson today, when you cross the Santa Cruz River by San Javier, the black mountain that is there, right at the river that you cross, that is a pile of volcanics. That is part of an old volcano. Um, uh, the Tucson Mountains are volcanics also. Uh, they're related. So there's a lot of old volcanism that's left. If you go out, uh, even go out up here, I actually should be up there, going because since north is that way right now, um, up Pendleton Drive to Josephine Canyon, and take uh, Camino Josefina out a ways, you'll see lava rock on the surface, basalt lava on the surface. Now it's broken up. It's uh, a broken up layer. It's highly weathered. But it's the fact that there used to be volcanoes here that were active. The Nogales Formation has interbedded volcanics within it as well. So um, that gets back to where our origins of our mountains are. Now, we can't really end this without once again talking about isostasy. I briefly talked about it under the idea of with the subduction zones, or I mean the seafloor, as well as with plate tectonics, but I want to go over it one more time. Just simply because it helps us understand how mountain ranges um, evolve over time. So if you remember, in the idea of isostasy, less dense crust basically floats on top of denser and deformable rocks in the mantle. So the way we were doing it was to say, imagine, if you will, that we have columns in the earth to an arbitrary depth. 
And those columns are going to be roughly the same, or have to be the same area. Therefore, they contain, uh, at least in cross-section, they're the same. So they have the same area in them. What's going to change with them is the amount of certain materials that are within them. Now, if we draw this simplistically, and very simplistically, like this, um, where this is our arbitrary depth within the Earth. And we'll just draw in, I'll dot in sea level just for the fun of it. Okay, there's sea level. We have, in this case, we're just saying two different types of material. D1, delta 1 and Delta 2. And in this case, Delta 1 is, den is less dense than Delta 2, i.e. Delta 2 is denser material. If the if the mass in each column is the same, so that the mass in column 1 has to equal the mass in column 2, which has to equal the mass in column 3, so forth and so on to the end, how do we do that if we've got materials of different densities and different uh, of different densities and therefore going up into different topographical differences? If we look at column four, column four has a lot more material in it than column one does, but column four rises up higher. The way this works is that the volume of less dense material is much greater than the volume of more dense material. So the the volume times the density is going to give you the mass. And so if you have a lot of lighter materials, you need more of it to account for the same amount of mass. And if it, you have more of it, it's going to naturally float higher. It's part of the reason why if you look at woods, different types of wood float differently. Um, <clears throat> uh, Bosa really floats up uh, high. Uh, cork even higher. Oak floats lower. If you get African blackwood, it doesn't float at all. It sinks because it's 40% denser than water. So the density of the material versus what it's floating in really changes things. So um, a, good, a good example of this is take an egg, a raw egg, put it in a glass of water. It sinks. Okay. Take that same glass of water and start adding salt to it and you'll actually get the egg to start to float because the salt water is denser and the light egg will float on it. So this idea of gravitational flotation for the crust or the uh, lithosphere is, again, isostasy. So if we remove weight or add weight, we're going to cause those blocks to change and adjust gravitationally with each other to get back into equilibrium. Um, so this is going to cause these things to move up and down. Again, remember that uh, if, we array, if we weather this down, we're going to cause this to push up because we have to bring material up underneath to reestablish the balance. So if we remove, let's just say I was to arbitrarily remove in this one here all that material automatically just it's gone this would have to adjust upwards but it's adjust it will not adjust up all the way to where it was because of the density difference it will adjust say maybe to the blue line there so it will adjust upwards it doesn't go as far as it uh, as the material that was removed but it still goes up So if we add material, it's going to adjust down. If we subtract material, it adjusts back up. This is part of the reason why when we look at features like the Appalachians or the Caledonians, um, we're looking into these mountain ranges much, much deeper than we are when we're looking at similar points within the Himalayas today. 
we're looking at rocks that have been shoved down deeper and, and have undergone more degrees of metamorphism, etc. This is also why we can see the very, very ancient mountain ranges as what are called green schist belts um, in the the in the shields of the continents, where these are former mountain ranges that have been long since weathered flat, and we're looking at the very basal roots of those mountains. Now, this is all made more complex by the fact that you have, you have vertical motions within the mantle, and you can actually have uplifting of whole continents. Um, much of Africa actually sits up higher than we believe it should, just simply because of a large mass of material that is uplifting or upwelling underneath uh, Africa, as well as the heat buildup that's occurred out under Africa, because based on some of the paleomagnetic evidence that we have, the continent of Africa, relative to its location today, hasn't moved much in a few hundred million years. So it's kind of like a stable point um, at this point in time. It's moved a little, but it hasn't moved as much as, say, North America or South America have. Regions where we had ice that were covering during the last ice age show a lot of uplifts right now because the ice depressed the ground and now it's rebounding, especially around the Great Lakes. Uh, the continental margins where sediment is being deposited, like around the Mississippi River or the east coast of the United States, tend to show as this as well. Uh, where they're getting these sediments added on and they're sinking down instead of rising up. Now, one of the big problems that we have in plate tectonics today, which simply because we haven't seen it happen, is how do we start subduction? What is the mechanism for crustal subsidence? Um, we know that the subducting lithosphere will detach and go downwards and uh, create a tug on the overriding continent. We know that the crust can be pulled down enough to allow the ocean to extend inland. But the mechanism to start that process off is still something we're not re frankly really sure about because part of the problem you get is that until the the, uh, the lithospheric material is shoved down deep enough, it's actually more buoyant and it will continue to float. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and leave it off here and I'll talk to you guys next time.